you use the phrase hyperintellectual to describe George Jackson. Um, what do you mean by that phrase? And um, in George Jackson's own writings, um, he uses the world, word third world. Um, and a lot of, lot of my peoples inside, you know, used to, well, we third world, you know, it's, you know they made it a, a thing, to, to, like a badge of honor, you know, because it represented struggle. But um, we want, I wanted to know, we wanted to know, you know, on a larger scale, what is third world nation in a first world country? Besides how, a colony, how do, how do you describe? How do you how do you describe? Define that. Yeah, that's why I wanted to start with Kathleen, even though she wasn't in the title. And increasingly, I just keep coming back to Kathleen. I mean, the way I read Kathleen, it's a colony, right? And so, is it going to look like a colony in which the elites drift towards structure and just reinforce structure? You know the elites of a colonized caste or race, right? Or can it look like something where we organically organize to redefine structure? And I think it's more, it's, I think in a competitive culture, the point is to be exceptional. Like the first black this, or the first brown that, or the first trans this, or the first woman this, et cetera, et cetera. And that exceptionality is supposed to be protection, right? But the people I meet who are the first don't seem to be particularly happy um, in the spaces they occupy. They feel to be pressed on all sides. And as, as much compassion as I have for them, I try not to, I try not to forget about class because then I can't think about poor people. Like my mind has so much bandwidth. Like if my students, you know, and they really have real needs and desires and they're really struggling and they feel persecuted and they are persecuted because it's just, it's just the nature of, you know, institutions, right, that are built historically. Well, you know, you do the whole slavery and social justice, so you know what it's built on. That is real suffering. But so, you know, are people living in NYCHA, public housing with like lead paint and mold and rats and dealing with the NYPD or homeless people or trans, you know, people. There's a caravan of 60 trans folks that came across the border. And, you know, Trump just said he doesn't do asylum. And, and one of my former, Tony's former students from Brown is now um, an attorney and works with big oil and gas, but pro bono does all this work. Well, they've been, you know, tortured, they're mutilated. You can clearly see that they need assistance, but they ban medical help, they keep changing the rules when the attorneys can come meet. And it's, that for me is a level of reality that has to coexist with people who have more material privilege and who are suffering too. Mm -hmm. But because our spaces tend to be isolated, the suffering among the privileged tends to dominate these other stories or these other stories become like trauma discourse or trauma porn and you just get overwhelmed by it and you turn off the news or you stop reading you know, the news feed. So I went with Kathleen because I think Kathleen does what Angela does not do. I think when I listen to the discourse of Angela and abolitionism, there's like a promissory note, right? that if we do restorative justice, if we keep staying with the program, we're gonna have some kind of evolutionary uh, moment and move to a better place. And if you look online, she's like, um, she has a forum with Michelle Alexander at Union Theological Seminary. Because Michelle Alexander, right, is an attorney, taught in law school, and she finally said, you can't reform this after she did the new Jim Crow. So she left law school, and now she's in a seminary. And so she asked Angela, is this an article of faith? Is this religious faith that stuff is gonna get better? That abolitionism is gonna work? And there's this pause, because there's no answer to it. So like, struggle now is aspiration. It's now desire. It's, in, it's now important things like community care, but that does not directly confront predatory structure. And that's the missing piece, and that's why you know I have to go back to to Kathleen, who even talks about class divisions among black people, 
Okay, so much of the narrative I found today is like we have to stick together and then we have to have coalitions with everybody. And I'm like, what's the ideology? And then it's like intersectionality. And I'm like, no, that's additive. There's an intersectionality, like you could gender, race, class, sexuality. I've never heard anybody add ideology into intersectionality. Because I want to know, like, if you're feminist, da, 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 are you a liberal? Or you're radical. Because if I don't know your ideological marker, we're not going to work together just because we have precarity. Mm -hmm. Because the material conditions are not going to be changed just by precarity. They're going to be changed by people who actually have blueprints. And that's what we're missing. I feel like the blueprints, they didn't, they didn't work, you know? Well, they don't work, you know, if the FBI comes in like Fred Hampton and kills you, <laughs> like at four in the morning. Or they don't work if Chris Hani gets assassinated in South Africa because it's a communist and alternative to Nelson Mandela. Or they don't work if Martin Luther King, you know, yes, they don't work because you have these pauses. But the violence against us is not going to stop. I mean, this time they just burned the archives. And then they burn the churches. And then they do it. The violence will never stop unless we have a blueprint. And it feels to me that the academy wants to study the phenomenon, but will not offer a blueprint and will not green light anybody who takes the risk to try to draw up a blueprint. 